everybody from Mexico. It's really my pleasure um, to be sharing this um, presentation with you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be um, one second. I'm going to be talking about basic tricks and this is not meant for seniors. I'm sure seniors know much more than me, but uh, this is all meant for our juniors and young trainees. Uh, this is a talk uh, that that is very close to my heart because there are so many um, errors that we make while we're doing simple cervical surgery. And so it's important for us to um, understand those. And uh, from our experience, what we have learned, we have to share that experience with the young people. So here we go. I thank again, the National College of Neurosurgeons in Mexico for inviting me for this. And it's really my pleasure to join my Mexican friends. Um, why do we do surgery anteriorly uh, when we're doing surgery for cervical spine? Generally, it's because, you know, there is direct vision and there's removal of herniated disc, osteophytes, and when you've got an OPLL, which is at two level and anteriorly, then we go in anteriorly. Obviously, when we want to fuse, um, do interbody fusion or where disc is herniated out following trauma, then obviously anterior decompression is much better if the pressure is from front. So exposure can be all the way from atlas down the way down to C7, sometimes up to C, uh, T2 as well. Goals of any kind of surgery is decompression of the cord, nerve root, and stabilize at the same time. Indications as we have discussed, degenerative conditions, trauma, tumor, and infections. So what are the types of ventral approach that we routinely do? So there is one in which what we do is we move the esophagus onto one side and the carotids onto the other. And this is our usual anterior medial approach. And this is what we do for our simple cervical disc, OPLL, simple anterior approaches. But when we have got tumor and we want to come um, uh, parallel to the vertebral artery, sometimes we go in lateral to the carotids. And when you go lateral to the carotids, we can come uh, laterally, drill out, thin out, the, sorry, the vertebral root, and then enter into the tumor. And you can see that if the vertebral is between, then we have got control coming from the lateral aspect. So the anterior medial approach generally that we take uh, goes around the sternohyoid and the sternothyroid, medial to the carotid, and that's how we come anteriorly. And uh, these are important steps for us to know. I'm just going to briefly go through the, do an overview and then go through the steps of surgery. So these are the different types of surgeries we can do when we are operating anteriorly. Uh, the advantages we have just discussed, the pathologies anteriorly, so obviously direct decompression. And it is good for all postures. If you've got kyphotic spine, straight spine, lordotic spine, Whichever way it is, you can correct that according to how much of a graph you're going to put in, how many levels will you do. So all that will change the curvature and you can improve that scenario. Uh, there is structural graph, fusion facilities available anteriorly, and it follows simple tissue plane. You have to do no muscle dissection. Unlike the posterior approach which is very painful and has risk of infection, anterior approach, the risk of infection is one in 100. It's negligible. It's not there anymore. And even that one in 100 would be somebody that, God forbid, if he injured the esophagus due to one or another. So you have to be very careful about that, especially in redo surgery. Now I'm going to go into the history of this. Uh, relevant anatomy, I think we need to understand the triangles. And we know this from our anatomy that the carotid triangles yeah. anteriorly and the muscular <laughs> triangle anteriorly. Um, we need to know that longus coli muscle run on both sides. Um, and this is uh, simple stuff that we already know. So surface anatomy is important before we make an incision. Nowadays, obviously, every incision is confirmed by, a, the level is confirmed by a lateral image intensifier uh, x-ray or some kind of um, uh, imaging to ensure that you're going at the right level so that you do not run into trouble. So the best thing is to come exactly perpendicular to the um, uh, pathology instead of coming more going more superiorly or anterior, inferiorly and then running into trouble and causing a lot of retraction. So hyoid bone we know is at the level of C3 vertebral body, thyroid cartilage at C4-5 disc space and cricoid 
um, the rings, they lie at the level of C6 level. So if you look at uh, like this, so you, know, you can see the hyoid, um, and you're talking about the laryngeal prominence, the cricoid cartilage lower down, and the thyroid cartilage. So we, if we know this uh, anatomy, then it's much easier for us to come in at the right level instead of worrying about at what level we're going to go in. Um, just going to show this small uh, video. So if, if you take the skin down and muscles one by one, so there are multiple layer of muscles which are important for us, but the most important for us when we are approaching this is uh, the uh, longus coli muscle on both sides. So uh, the relevant anatomy, visceral anatomy regarding vessel, nerves, and visera. Uh, I think if we all know this, that uh, on both sides the carotid runs, and on the left side we have the recurrent running at the same time in the groove, whereas on the right side it turns around, uh, loops, and then comes back. The, uh, the left side is completely different to the right, and I will show that shortly. The, the anterior jugular system is, has got a lot of radiation, but we need to know that um, they, they are running uh, parallel to our incision, so it should not be a problem. But many a times, if they come in your way, you can easily take them. Uh, common carotids obviously give superior thyroid, inferior thyroid, and you've got these three um, thyroid veins right in front of it. And on the left side, important is to remember that uh, thoracic duct crosses there and you have to be careful. Vertebral artery usually enters um, and at C6 in about 90% of the cases, but may enter in, at C5 in 7% and C7, 3%. So you need to be aware of that. If you're going to be any surgery in that area, especially of the tumor surgery, I think it's important that you know where exactly it's entering from so you don't make any mistakes. Um, neural anatomy, obviously, glossopharyngeal, hypoglossal, vagus nerve are important in this area. So, uh, superior laryngeal nerve is at the level of superior thyroid artery, and the recurrent laryngeal nerve on both sides I'm going to show shortly in detail as well. And you've got cervical sympathetics running on both sides underneath the longus coli muscle. So, again, superior laryngeal nerve is usually at the level of C3-4, at the level of superior thyroid artery, and this is where superior laryngeal nerve would be. Recurrent in the tricuricipital groove. Uh, on the right side, it may cross the surgical area at C5-6, um, and may not, you, it, you may not have a non-recurrent vertebral artery, a, a recurrent laryngeal nerve as well. So I think it's important to remember that. So ha let's have a look at the um, recurrent laryngeal nerve here. So, so if you see here, th this is the recurrent laryngeal nerve on one side. So it recurs and goes up, whereas the other recurrent laryngeal nerve is all the way down because it's coming around the vessel. So it takes uh, that low a curve. So it's not going to come in your way. And then, so our right side is here and the left side is all the way down on the other side. So I think it's important to understand that and understand that fully. Uh, sympathetics uh, start from C2 um, to the thoracic outlet uh, between carotid sheath and longus coli, and they run like this. And there are three ganglions, and we, if you remember from our anatomy, the superior ganglion is at C23, the middle at the level of C6, and the stellate ganglion at the level of uh, the first rib and C7 transverse process. And you can see the three, uh, the stellate ganglion all the way down and the other nerves running up. Again, let's have a look at this on this um, model. And you can see this is the middle, the stellate ganglion, and the superior ganglion is all the way up here at C23. You can see the recurrent laryngeal nerve running there, and these ganglions and sympathetic trunk running all the way up. And this is the superior cervical ganglion. Okay, so surgical technique, uh, you know, both sides are okay. If you're right-handed, you can come from the right side. If you're left-handed, you can come from the left side. Um, the identification is usually with a C-arm, as I said, skin incision. I, what I usually do, I give in skin incision and put in a, a small um, retractor underneath the skin and ask my assistant to lift it up so there are no problems and we can cut the platysma without uh, causing any problems to underlying structures. And there is sharp dis and blunt dissection together. And you come across the three layers of the fascia and you cut two of them one by one. The transverse incision is okay if you want to be doing more than three level. 
uh, or if you have had uh, multiple approaches going anteriorly, then you can use that approach as well. Um, for up to three levels, I usually do transverse level, transverse sensation, and it works very well as long as you undermine it well. Uh, skip discectomy, I do routinely. So for example, if I have to do three, four, and I have to do six, seven, I would give two separate incisions. Um, and that gives very good um, uh, results as well from the skin perspective. We have talked about this, what level is what? So you need to remember that, that angle of mandible C23, high R34, thyroid C45, cricoid C6, and supraclavicular groove is C71. Um, so a blunt and sharp dissection. And once you have opened up the platysma and the fascia, you put in your finger and you make sure your carotid is lateral, put in your lung and back retractors. And then what you can do is you can use a um, trim line or whatever retractors you have to retract then from there onwards. The legs of the fascia, obviously the deep uh, cervical fascia and the free tracheal fascia are open. So these are, the, uh, these are the fascia that we need to cut on the way down. Once we are there, we need to make sure that the esophagus is uh, pushed on the, upper, on the opposite side. I usually check every time that I'm giving an incision on this fascia that the esophagus is nicely tucked underneath the lengen back on the opposite side. So you put in, you place your retractors, whatever retractors you have underneath the longus coli. An important thing to remember is these um, the sharp and blunt retractors in majority of our systems. And the sharp retractors go in underneath the longus coli and not superior and inferior because you can cause injury um, to the surrounding visual structures. And then you uh, remove all the disc, remove the posterior annulus. The only place where I don't remove posterior annulus sometimes when I'm happy, there is not much posterior uh, compression and all I need to do is other kind of pathology to be addressed. And you know, in trauma, sometimes it's completely stuck and also you don't need to remove it as long as you have decompressed it well. Um, you inspect the PLL and if required, you can remove the ligamentous disc uh, with the help of a hook. Uh, you resect the disc convertible and unconvertible spurs and those are important because if you're not going to take that down, your plate is not going to come on top uh, very well as you want. So this has to be drilled up and this lower bit has to be drilled as well. And I usually use small punches at this stage or a, uh, a diamond burr at the, at the lower level to clear it out. Uh, the decompression has to be from uh, all the way across and you need to make sure you're, you've taken out the disc completely. So both the unconvertible joints are completely seen when you're doing an anterior cervical discectomy. Um, so different kinds of decompression we need to do, but anytime you're doing it, you use the drill to really thin it out and then lift it up with the hook. And that's the safest way of doing it. The most important thing at this time is to keep the blood pressure up. And if you do have the perfusion pressure up, then only you're going to have very good results. Otherwise you can run into problems uh, with anesthetist. So um, how about plating? The important thing to remember is the plate has to be as short as possible. You don't want to be putting plate um, on, onto the disc space on the opposite side, on the uh, disc above and below. And the screw has to be angled away from uh, the plate. So if it's uh, inferiorly, then obviously it's going down inferior. If it's superiorly, it's going superior like that. Uh, because that will give you a double locking system via your screw itself as well. Also, these screws come in medially. And the reason you want to bring in them medially about 15 to 20 degrees is to avoid at any cost hitting the vessels going on the both sides because you don't want to be going outside with these. You don't want to be doing too much of an angle. Otherwise, you will, you're going to ruin the um, bone itself and the, you, you may have a free piece of bone sticking out. So if you're putting in screws like that, this is not the best way of doing it. The best way is if the screw is going up like that and down like that, away. Away and inside is the way to go, away and medially. So I think if you have got a bone in between, I think biomechanically it's nice to put in a screw in between as well. And you know different kinds of screws, uh, instrumentation, et cetera, you can use. And then you widen the neural foramen all the way and see the root all the way laterally. Uh, you're going to have graft failure, et cetera, uh, if you're not going to be thinking about biomechanical principles. So graft and um, graft-related complications could go up to up to 18%, but in, in, uh, uh, if you are careful, then you can bring this down to less than 1%.
Uh, just in levels, uh, degeneration has been reported up to 18 to 20 percent, and in some cases, 25 percent. It will only happen if you do not, uh, if you if you do not disturb the adjacent level, uh, or you do not address the biomechanical problem that's present at that uh, stage. So it's important to understand. So you use your graph for improvement of biomechanics. Um, so what's the difference between a simple discectomy and a fusion? So immediate relief when both of them. Uh, axial pain may persist in these in patients who only have simple discectomy. It does resolve, but it may take up to weeks and months. And patients don't like to see that. So in majority of cases, I fuse, but I give them that option that that option is there. Long-term outcome, there is no instability. Um, there is fibrous stabilization in simple discectomy if you don't use a graft. Uh, postural changes can occur in some of these patients who have got multiple level disease. Patient satisfaction is equal or higher than fusion with simple discectomy if it's a single level problem. Um, what about uh, if, why, where would you use simple discectomy? If the level is one or two, if it's more than two, obviously you think about ACDF. Uh, soft disc, simple discectomy, large osteophytes, OPLL, biomechanical problem, obviously you need to use a graft. Um, what about posture? Laudotic, simple discectomy, straight kyphotic, anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Neck pain, if it's worse, you're thinking about that as a main problem, then you have to fuse. This height is less than four millimeter, simple discectomy would do the job. If it's more than four millimeter, it's better to um, have a, a ACDF. Again, it would depend on the biomechanics. If, the, if you've got kyphosis, then obviously you need to go in with a simple disc as well. And if it's less than four millimeter as well, you would fuse. So general, in general principle, both, are, both results are same. There is no difference, but you know, whatever is in your uh, hands that works best, you should do. Corpectomy and plating when the compression ex exceeds multiple levels. Um, I'm going to talk about briefly about anterior foramenotomy. I only do this in young patients who have got osteophytes, something like this, and who do not have adjacent level problem. Um, and you can come in, uh, drop in your um, drill all the way down by taking this piece of bone, and I will show you. Uh, and it's used in radiculopathy with lateral foraminal herniation with unconvertible osteophytes. So what you do is you, you drop your uh, retractor like that, and you come in, and you drill. And you drill this piece of bone, and you bring it down all the way. So this piece of bone is taken out, for, and this piece of disc is taken out as well. So once you've done that, you go all the way, and you drill, and you can clear that osteophyte or disc at that particular level. In the patients that I've operated up till now, there are not many, about 10 of them, very selected uh, patients. All of them are doing well and in the long run, uh, more than five years follow up. So I think uh, it is it is pretty reasonable option. Um, and the foramenotomy is done in a particular way. The important to remember this, these are, this is the way you need to drill. This is part of the joint that you need to take. And you can do either A, which we just showed, or you do B or C, depending on where exactly the osteophyte is. So it, that's how you decide where exactly you're going to go. Um, and then once you drill, you go all the way down posteriorly and then take out um, the last piece of bone with either a curette or a hook, and you remove that so the nerve root at that level is completely free. So this patient who had C56 brachialgia had this done and the results, as you can see, are pretty reasonable and the patient is uh, long-term follow-up is doing very well. What about oblique carpectomy? Yes, that's a very good option in an area where there is, it's, it's very, very cheap because you don't need to use any hardware. We use this in cervical myelopathy and we use an intervertebral disc, which uh, must be hard and collapsed and when there is no issue with instability. And you come, obviously, um, when you're coming in like that, you come in laterally, and then you come at an angle, and you drill this piece like that, and so that you can decompress both sides, but you leave this piece of uh, bone intact and this intact at the same time. So, and then you can see dura completely decompressed. Sometimes if you, when you're starting out, you can leave a bit of bone behind, and that's not a very good thing to, to do. And this actually I took from a friend of mine, Seth Nadiri from Istanbul. These are his slides. Um, and you can see the decompression from severe pressure to here. And in majority of their patients, they do, uh, do use this oblique carpectomy without using any kind of hardware. And you can see the results uh, pretty reasonable. 
approach related complications we know this uh, adjacent tissue organ damage and there are there are a lot of structures going around there uh, your graft or instrument problem clot we rarely see these days since we are very vigilant uh, infection is one in 600 not present uh, donor place problem we do, that doesn't happen these days since majority of the time we are not taking um, patients um, uh, bone and majority of the time it's uh, either peak cages or, um, or we use uh, uh, cadaveric bone. Um, late complications on union, et cetera, are very, very, very rare. So dysphagia, you do get in about five to 50% in our um, setup, we looked at it and it's up to 4% in our cases and we are very careful how we put place our retractors anteriorly. And if you do that properly and prongs are properly placed underneath the longus coli and you don't have to, uh, the, your prongs are not sticking into the esophagus then, uh, the results are pretty good. Recurrent laryngeal nerve um, uh, injury up to 2% of cases. Again, in our follow-up of over 600 cases, we have found this to be less than 1%. Esophageal injury, injury, we have had only one patient in the 600 who've, um, and that too was because um, of um, our mistake and not because uh, of any other problem. Vertebral artery injury is unheard of these days because we are very careful, use diamond burrs um, all the way down. So it's very, very simple. Tracheal injury, hematoma infection, we don't see that. Urotomy, if you, even if you have it, it's not a problem, but you, know, you don't see that anymore unless you're operating on OPLO or in trauma. So complication avoidance, diamond burr is the way to go. So don't push, you just let it come to yourself and drill accordingly. Uh, if you, any kind of graft you put in, you have to tap in uh, very careful that it's not going all the way and hitting the theca at all. So you tamp um, in the wrong position and you can give problems. So it has to be properly um, uh, done. The other thing is the anterior bone decompression has to be complete so that when you're applying plate, it should not be a problem. It should, it should not be lifting up from any side. Um, uh, when you're drilling, you need to be careful with the uh, vertebral artery at that stage laterally. So there are multiple things that you can do and you need to be wary about the results that you want them to be in uh, the best way forward. Again, I bring greetings from Pakistan and this is actually Islamabad, our capital. Um, we have uh, of the top uh, 10 mountains in the world, six are in Pakistan. And majority of the people who know that our northern areas of Pakistan are for K2 and the other Kurakaram range. So thank you. It was a pleasure uh, to be talking here. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Salman, uh, with you to join this uh, bilingual webinar. I think that your lecture was uh, very, very important for uh, residents and also for experts in uh, spine surgery. So uh, I have a question, uh, Salman. Uh, you talk about uh, vertebral artery injury is uh, less than 1%, but how about the lesion of a specific uh, radicular, uh, radicular artery coming from vertebral artery. So uh, we know that uh, these uh, very small arteries that are coming for the vertebral artery could be damaged, uh, especially in cases of uh, tumors or uh, also in degenerative uh, disease of the spine because of uh, its uh, intricate uh, pathology, intricate anatomy. So have you ever had or have you ever heard about uh, this kind of uh, damage? Uh, thank you, Victor. It's really my pleasure to, again, uh, and I'm grateful for um, uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, no, actually, um, we have speci especially looked at it. One of my uh, fellow who's um, a recent spine fellow has been working on it. And we're trying to look at different kinds of um, complications that we can look at because we're specifically looking at complications. And uh, uh, no, we haven't seen that at all. Um, there was a question about uncinate uh, joint itself. And again, for that as well, uh, as long as you're using a uh, diamond burr and you know um, where exactly you are burring, so that is not a problem at all. Um, and in patients whom, whom we are fusing, so that joint does not 
um, it, it does not become a big part itself because you'll be fusing with a big graft. You're going to be jacking it up anyway. So in those cases, uh, we haven't found any problem from that perspective. Thank you, Dr. Salman. Is there any question for uh, Dr. Salman, uh, colleagues? Yes. yes, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Dr. Salman, Dr. I'm Dr. Swell. I uh, did my CPS was uh, uh, preparing for Saudi concert exam. There was a question uh, that nobody answered regarding that for the graph that immediate post op stability after cervical discectomy, you put a graph. What is the uh, stability provided uh, in, in percentage? The graph gives 70% or 30%. It's the ratio 70, 30, 30, 70, and 50 by 50. So what is the exact percentage that the graph gave uh, stability immediately post uh, discectomy or perfectomy? And what okay. actual percentage gave by the plate or the screw? I think uh, what they are trying to ask is what, how much of um, uh, the the of the weight is taken up by the body yeah. and how, yes. how much yeah. of it is taken up by posterior elements. And we know that that seventy percent of the weight. Yeah. No, no, but this is taken up by the body and thirty percent. Sorry. Yes. Yes, sir. Please. Yes. So, so 70% is taken up by the body and 30% uh, by the posterior elements. So we know that. No, 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 sir. It's uh, the graph, it is uh, put an interiorly, for example, they put a graph. That's what uh, I'm saying. After the, the, yes. the anterior um, part of the body. So you are, what you're talking about, the uh, anterior elements, they uh, take up 70% of the weight in cervical spine. And that's why it's all that weight is 70% is going to be going through that graph that you'll be putting in anteriorly because uh, that's all the weight that's going to be taking. Yes, and and, and the 30% will, be... will be taken by the screw. That's correct. You, you mean that the 30% by the screw. Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, uh, is there a, any other question? Yes. Uh, Shulman, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tarek. For your uh, very nice presentation, uh, good to see you there. Uh, do you have any um, risk of uh, running into C5 uh, nerve palsy uh, through the anterior approach, or it's a safe uh, there? I think no. Uh, you know, if you have that risk, that risk is generally at C5. But you know, having um, in our 600 cases that we have just reviewed, uh, we have had only three uh, C5 palsy. And uh, uh, all three of them settle down within two weeks time, which is, you know, we don't see that. And the reason I, we see that is because we do, do not put in any anterior spreader. We mm -hmm. do not use any retractor anteriorly. So we're using our suction as a dynamic retractor. So we put it in between and we are tilting the suction to see the posterior part of the vertebral body in the disc. And because of that, we do not cause sustained pressure on the nerve itself. And we see that the, uh, the numbers of cervical uh, palsy are very, very low. And that is the trick to do it. And that's how everybody should learn instead of putting in a retractor and spreading it up. And how do you take care of the uh, dura tear uh, if you're doing just ACDA through a very small? Uh, I know it's a difficult sometime. Uh, you can use various uh, things, but uh, do you ever have to repair it from interiors? No. So yeah. what we do is we have got a thing called, called taco seal. I'm not advertising anything, but taco seal is made by Baxter as well as by, as well as by Takeda, two companies yeah. make it. So it has Dura on one side and it has a sealant on the other side. And we usually use for our cranial surgeries routinely. For example, I did a CSF fistula today of our brain and we use that. But so we use the same thing in spine if they are stuck, but for simple, yeah. For simple leaks, I do not even bother. I put a sponge stand and uh, I would put in my graft and um, plate and close. And we do not, then we do just use a gravity drain. We do not use a suction drain. You, you saying that it's a dural patch? Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a dural patch with a sealant on one side. We're using it here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh